So I'm Dr Hazel O'Dowd, I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and I'm a pain specialist and I've worked in the field of pain for 25 years and I was going to talk to you today uh, about pain, uh, about the experience of pain and why psychology is so such a big part of it. So you'll notice that one of my first slides is, um, is of a baking set and the reason that I've done that is because we often Imagine that pain is a very straightforward stimulus response experience, but it isn't. And in order to create the experience of pain, you need many different elements. Just like when you're baking, you need many different ingredients in order to create the cake. And you don't have to have all of them, but you have to have several. So I was going to talk today about what some of those ingredients are. Pain perception always occurs in the brain. It doesn't happen anywhere else. But in order for that to happen, you need a nociceptive stimulus. And by that, that means something needs to touch the nerve endings of the body. We don't have pain receptors, uh, nobody does. But we have nerve receptors that register changes in temperature, chemistry and pressure and they send messages to the brain via the central nervous system. And when it reaches the brain, the brain makes a decision about whether it's going to code it as pain or not. And that process happens no matter what the circumstances, whether you've broken a leg, whether you've got a bulging disc and a trapped nerve, uh, whether you have fibromyalgia, whether it's toothache, whatever the context of the pain, it will always follow this same process. And the coding, the signals that get to the brain, are affected by lots of different things. And the central process in the brain that understands the coding and registers it will take information from lots of different areas of the brain. And those coding, coding messages will depend on the level of arousal, it will depend on things like how many neurotransmitters are in the brain at any one time and they can be ones that the body naturally produces or they can be ones that have been added through medication. Things like where your conscious attention is, your beliefs and expectations about pain, your past experience and the way in which you make decisions will all have an impact on how and when you feel pain. Research into pain has been going on for many, many years, many decades. And a lot of the research is around the same theme. How does tissue pathology relate to the perception of pain? And one of the earliest studies that I really like was from Beecher et al., a research group in the 1950s, who looked at the experience of soldiers and civilians suffering injury during the war, the Second World War. And what their team looked at uh, as a broad measure of the pain experienced was the amount of medication that people requested following their injuries. And Beecher and his research group tried to match the injuries in terms of location, um, the severity, the, the nature of the injury. And then they compared the amount of pain medication that soldiers requested with that from civilians. And you can see on the slide that there was a huge difference with soldiers asking for only a fraction of the pain medication that civilians asked for. And obviously there are lots of reasons why that might be the case. It might just be that soldiers are much tougher than average civilians. But they didn't conclude that from their study, which I'm summarising for you in a few, in a few minutes. They concluded that what was significant was the meaning of the injury to the individual. So for the soldiers, the injury that took them away from the battlefield and into hospital was actually very positive because it took them away from the front line and it meant that they were no longer at risk. Whereas for civilians, the injury had a very different meaning and they were more distressed and more traumatised, not relieved, and therefore experiencing pain in a different way and requesting more pain relief. There's been multiple studies along the same theme, but what it tells us quite clearly 
is that the brain is not a relay station and that there is no linear link between tissue pathology and the experience of pain. Incoming data from the body put together with memories and experiences and the cognitive processes that the brain naturally engages in all act together to create the sensation of pain and they can turn it up or they can turn it down. So why are so many patients left with chronic pain? You may be interested to know that chronic pain affects around 20% of the population and when we say chronic we don't mean chronically awful, we mean long-lasting pain. And just to put it into context, 20% of the population means that if you looked at the population of Europe, for example, 750 million people, the statistics, the epidemiologists tell us that around 150 million people will be experiencing constant pain at any one time. And that's the equivalent of the entire population of France and Germany put together. So chronic pain, constant pain, isn't weird or unusual, it's actually extremely common. And I think what our patients struggle with, and sometimes what we struggle with, are all notions of pain, of being a symptom, a symptom of some underlying disease process or tissue pathology. And of course, that's often the case, but it's not always the case. Recent research uh, in pain neurophysiology tells us that chronic pain has become a disease in its own right. And that most chronic pain left over after our treatments are due to a disturbance in the way the nervous system is now functioning. And it's a processing error and I often liken this with patients to it being like a burglar alarm on a house. So initially, when somebody breaks in, the burglar alarm will be activated and then uh, usually the NHS will swing into action to find out what's caused the alarm to go off. And it'll check the windows, it'll check the doors, it'll look around the house for, for the intruder. And sometimes it finds an intruder and it fixes the window and it fixes the door. Uh, and in an ideal situation, the alarm then resets and the organism goes back to normal. But in chronic pain, it doesn't reset. So the window gets replaced, the door gets fixed, but the alarm keeps ringing. And lots of our patients find this a very helpful way of understanding what their pain means. And it can help them to get off the conveyor belt of constantly seeking more investigations and more answers. So pain clinics and pain specialists will look at what may have gone wrong in the processing system. And what we know is that there are things that turn up the burglar alarm, they can turn up how high the alarm rings, and there are things that can turn it down. And only a tiny proportion of that will be the tissue damage or the nociceptive pain that may have triggered the reaction. So neurochemical modulation of the pain system is happening all the time. And of course, our mood also creates changes in our neurochemistry. And that will have an impact too on the pain system. More recent work in the pain world has discovered that actually the pain system can change over time with ongoing persistent pain signals. So the pain system actually becomes more adapted to transmitting pain signals over a long period of time. There are neuroplastic changes that we witness. The changes in the brain that happen when pain, pain occurs are loosely covered by the field of psychology. And the particular areas that are of interest to us are how the brain processes information, how it decodes incoming signals, the process of perception, things about learnt behaviour, and conditioning, so the classic stimulus response reaction that the brain starts. Nerve root processing status, so that's in the central nervous system, in the spinal column. At the bottom of the spinal column is almost like a turning up and a turning down neurochemical switch. And that's affected by arousal, by attention, by concentration. 
and then importantly our memories, our beliefs and how we understand pain play a vital role in the experience. There's a really interesting pain researcher and I've got a, a link to a YouTube clip from him later on. He's called Lorimer Mosley and he's a, a pain researcher from Australia and he talks about one of his own experiences of having a painful experience. And you'll all know a similar story or have had something similar yourselves, although maybe not quite as dramatic as Lorimer's example. But he was out in the bush doing some wild camping and he had shorts on and he went for a walk through the long grass and he felt a, a slight scratch on his leg and thought nothing of it. But before he got back to camp, he'd become critically ill and had to be airlifted to his local hospital. And it turned out that he'd been bitten by one of the most venomous snakes in Australia and nearly lost his life. Happily though, he didn't. He came back to the world of pain research and he will often talk about the next time he went wild camping. Again, he was in shorts, walking through the long grass and felt a slight scratch on his leg. And this time, when he looked down and could see the slight scratch, he felt an immediate and overwhelming pain sensation. He was in agony. And again, he barely made it back to camp. But when he did and got to see a medic, they said, Lorimer, you've just scratched your leg on a twig. And what this tells us about pain is that memory plays a huge role in the creation of that perception. And it's really the brain's way of trying to look after the body. So because those circumstances were so similar to the situation in which he nearly died, the brain had kept a special note of those circumstances and was primed to react with all of its warning bells and alarm systems on max the next time that happened. And we see that all the time in our patients for whom situations which triggered their pain then become highly frightening and anxiety provoking for them. So the interesting thing of course about these memories and attentions uh, tension, perception, beliefs, the psychology of pain is that we're not always consciously aware of the impact of these events on our day-to-day -day life. And we know now that we have two mental processes, two thought processes running at the same time. We have conscious thought and we have unconscious thought. And they operate quite differently. So our conscious ability to think and mull things over is a more slow uh, process, takes a bit more time, you can focus the attention on it, it takes a lot more effort because you're turning things over in your mind and actively working on them. You can be flexible in how you think about things and you can be conscious, aware of the process. But there's another level of thinking that goes on that's unconscious. And in order to keep us alive and to get through the huge amount of information processing we have to deal with every day, this has a different set of rules. So it works very quickly. It happens outside of our conscious awareness. There is no attention. There's very minimal effort and it's highly rule driven. So we make fast, quick decisions based on previous experience and based on heuristics and algorithms that our brains put together over the years. And we don't know that's happening. We just see the result pop into consciousness at the end. And it's often at that level that our patients and ourselves are influenced by our memories and beliefs. And the important thing about all of these cognitive processes is that they are very sensitive to changes in mood, to fatigue, to medication, or indeed to any kind of emotional change in state. So really, when people tell us that they're feeling something, that they have a gut reaction, it's possible that they're listening to their unconscious thought processes, or it's possible that they've just got indigestion. Just to give you a working example of how our mood changes the way our brain works, if you think about depression, and maybe your own experiences of feeling gloomy one day, 
you'll notice that on days where you are feeling lower than normal, and certainly in clinical depression, we know that the way people's brains work changes. We know that the brain remembers more negative events. It's much easier to bring to mind times when we've embarrassed ourselves, felt sad when difficult things have happened. It's almost like they're all stored together in semantic space in the brain. And once you access one negative memory, the whole lot will tumble out. We also know that when your mood is low, you tend to attend to the more negative aspects of that situation. And scientists think that maybe this is an evolutionary tactic to try and work out what's gone wrong, to problem solve the difficulties. And in order to protect, protect ourselves and to move forwards, we tend to reach gloomier conclusions. We're naturally risk averse. When that happens, we lower our activity levels, we expose ourselves to fewer rewarding events, when something nice does happen, we effectively have a filter in place that protects us from it. A classic example for all of us would be when a colleague or friend compliments us. And one of our filters might be if we're not feeling too good about ourselves that day. They're just saying that to be nice, that's their job, they don't really mean it. And so this way of managing, dealing with the environment when you're depressed, is meant to be a problem-solving approach, but it can get stuck, especially if you have low self-esteem. And normal mood regulation techniques just don't work anymore, and certainly in clinical depression. You may have had the experience of trying to talk with somebody, trying to talk them out of their depression, but you can't. It's so stuck, it's very fixed. And it's a, it's a cognitive change that happens in everybody who gets low in mood, happens to everybody, right across every culture and every country. Another example of how psychology interferes, gets in the way, or can also help the experience of pain is through studies of fear avoidance. So again, this is possibly looking at that more unconscious level where the brain has paired two different stimuli. Early years of psychology research, uh, there was a researcher called Pavlov, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, who did a lot of training with dogs. And in the end, every time a bell rang, he would give the dog a treat. And after a certain number of trials, all he had to do was to ring the bell in order to cause salivation in the dog, even without the treat. And it's the same in the human being now. If you think about going on a roller coaster, and you really try and picture being on a roller coaster, if you think about that hard enough, and depending on how you feel about roller coasters, you may very well notice a physical reaction in your body just from thinking about it. You don't even have to be there. There's a lot of research gone on uh, in Europe by Hans Vleilen and his research team looking at how this affects people in pain. And I'm sure you can see that what happens is that when people have had lots of experiences of activity causing pain, they become avoidant of that activity. It's normal human nature. And they develop all kinds of what we call safety behaviours, ways of keeping themselves away from pain and out of pain through avoiding activity, avoiding certain events, always taking their medication, etc, etc. And these strategies start off as sensible coping behaviours. But in chronic pain, they often get stuck and become unhelpful. We also know that there's a lot of work around social communication and pain. And so we're very social creatures. And in pain management programs across the UK, we'll often start a program by videoing the way somebody moves in pain, in the presence of other people, and then when they're alone. And there's often huge differences in the way people move and the amount of noise they make, for example. And this isn't because people are seeking attention or making it up. It's all about social communication. And there's a whole, uh, there's a whole uh, checklist called the Waddle Signs, which you may be familiar with, that people use, which really assesses the difference between the way we move when we're being watched and when we're not. 
So these things are very normal psychological processes, but they can get out of hand and they can delay recovery and they can cause all kinds of problems for people living with pain. And we know that fear avoidance, anxiety about doing certain things at certain times occurs in anything up to 50% of the chronic pain population. One of the areas that I'm very interested in is trauma and the way in which trauma stamps an imprint on the person's brain. So PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is often present in the pain population with some prevalence studies estimating it to be as high as 90%. And that trauma doesn't need to be as we might traditionally think of it as a car crash, but it can be any threatening event where the person is distressed, is fearful, they will often relive it, they'll have flashbacks to it. An, an acute episode of pain is a classic example of something that leaves its mark on people's brains. And they will often remember the first time they went to A&E, um, the first time they were unable to move because of their pain problem. It's frightening and it's traumatic. And that changes the way the brain functions in response to further events. And it's very somatic, it's a whole body experience. And people often relive it time and time again. They become avoidant, they might have nightmares, and they're on edge. And you can see that all of those responses designed to keep the person safe actually just turn up that burglar alarm and intensify the pain experience. So the common experience of all of our patients with constant pain is often in, way, in the way in which the pain emerges for them. They will all talk about the difficulty they've had in having tests and being investigated and failing to find a solution. Many of them will be very stuck with the paradigm that the pain is a symptom of some underlying disorder that's been missed. They're distressed by the fact the pain doesn't go away. In our culture, we expect great things of medicine. And our hope is that the pain will go away. It will be cured. It's very difficult for people to understand that it can be the pain system itself that becomes dysfunctional. So they will often talk about a failure in treatment, uh, a failure in diagnosis, feeling that the system has let them down, because people just can't believe that there's no solution. Sometimes it makes them think that they're not believed, that if somebody really understood how much pain they were in, they would do something about it, without really understanding that sometimes there's nothing you can do. But it's a difficult place to be in, to feel like somebody's withholding a treatment, because you don't understand what's happening to your body. So the ongoing symptoms of pain and the lack of resolution can sometimes be interpreted as people not helping or disbelieving them. And also, it can have the effect of really undermining the patient's confidence. They start to think that maybe there's something wrong with them, that they're weak, that they're just not tough enough, that maybe they are making it up and going mad. And so over time, with the constant investigations, and no solution, and in the absence of a good explanation of chronic pain, people can become very distressed. There are specialist services for people with chronic pain, and pain management programs are now an established treatment uh, across the world for chronic pain. And they look at things like mood and emotion, people's cognitive style, their type of thinking and processing, their beliefs about pain and things that have happened to them in the past, their behaviour, are they doing things to inadvertently make things worse, but in an attempt to make things better? What are they avoiding? What unhelpful ways have they developed to try and keep themselves safe that are no longer relevant? The programs might look as if there's trauma and can that be treated? And we will always talk to people about the example of John. And we talk about John falling off a ladder, hurting his back. And we will get the patients to talk with us about the kind of things John experiences in those first few weeks when he has a, 
an acute injury and then how he might be feeling three months down the line and then how he's feeling two years down the line if the pain is still there. And in talking about John with our patients, what we're trying to help them understand is that the impact of living with chronic pain can be as problematic as the pain itself. Pursuing a cure that isn't there, feeling disbelieved, trying to take more and more medication in order to get rid of a pain that won't respond, becoming low, depressed, self-isolating, avoiding activities that previously would have given you pleasure, becoming unfit. All of these kind of changes in behaviour and understanding become a problem in their own right. And so in talking with patients about pain, we're trying to help them make a shift from understanding it in terms of damage and cure to looking at their function and management. And what we know is that patients who do best with these programmes are not the ones who've got a certain type of injury or experience a certain kind of pain, but it's all about the psychosocial factors. It's all about where they are psychologically and in the context in which they live. So the biggest predictors of a good outcome are always psychosocial. So really in summary, good pain management will look at all of the secondary problems and try and help the patient address those. And if you can manage those, then you will be turning down the pain system for them. Help with their mood, help with becoming more mobile, trying to help them overcome things they're avoiding, manage their anxiety, improve their sleep, increase their function so they're back to doing things that they enjoy and they value, help them with their cognitive problems which are often frightening, they can't concentrate, they feel like they can't think straight, often that's made worse by medication that actually isn't helping the symptoms of pain at all. Trying to connect them with others, get them back involved in some social activities or some social connections and trying to stop them from activity cycling. So pain is often variable, good days and bad days. And on good days it's totally human nature to just go nuts, to try and catch up, to do all the things that you couldn't do yesterday because it was a bad day. So there are lots of strategies for trying to help people manage pain more effectively. And in doing that, you will be affecting their neurophysiology and actually turning down the pain sensations. We're not expecting to get rid of it. This dysfunction in the pain system is probably there for the long haul, but you can moderate it and you can calm it down. So I hope this video has been helpful to you in understanding more about pain and the psychology of pain. I've included here some resources that you can use for your own education or to share with your patients. There's a great deal of information out there on the internet if you were to Google chronic pain, but these are my favourites. Thank you.